JJ, what's up, my friend? Yeah, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing great. 13 days into the World Cup. Yeah. And even without the Americans, I think there's been a storyline and drama and excitement that checks every box thus far. Yeah, days have gone by. Family members have been ignored. Sleep has been optional. <laughs> Just walking around in a zombie-like state. But you're right. It's moving so fast. that You, you think you, rem- you go back to that. It's only last what, Friday week that we saw that amazing Portugal-Spain game. Forget about it. It's gone. There's so much happened, even yeah. over the weekend. I know. And numbers have been way up. The Germany-Sweden game did 6.7 million viewers. The Mexico game, the last Mexico match, combined of the two telecasts, Spanish and American, and the U.S., did over 7 million viewers. Those are numbers akin to the NLCS. So you're talking about a lot of eyeballs watching matches that don't involve the U.S. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, but it's it's captivating stuff. It's totally. dramatic stuff. It's it's like little episodes of The Sopranos. I mean, there's so much going on in each one. And even if there's not maybe a great amount of skill, action, or goals, you've got so many other elements. And I think the games in the group stage have mattered so much. And there, you know what? There's been no nil-nils. No None. nil-nils. None. There's been at least a goal scored in every match. And that's huge. And, I mean, I don't want to condescend to Americans, but that has been a complaint over 70 years. Hey, if you don't have a rooting interest, you at least want to see a goal. Right. And so we've had a goal in every single match. You and I talked about what teams, what countries, compared to what teams before the tournament began. We looked at Argentina, and the two comps we came up with were the Dan Marino Dolphins, Mm. One great star, and they just could not get over the hump or the Buffalo Bills always left at the altar. Messi's Argentinian team is once again in dire straits, complete dysfunction. Messi looks like he's emotionally out of it. What do you make of watching Messi in the first two matches? First of all, they defer to him. The ball has to come to him. It comes into the center. It crowds the play. There's no real plan other then did we get the ball to Messi? That's the first thing. But the body language thing, which people have have honed in on, I've never seen Messi as this effusive um, kind of uh, Ronaldinho-style player who always had a smile on his face. He's always been very close to the vest. Right. But certainly it was disturbing to see the national anthems being played and he is massaging in the most stressed way possible his forehead. Yeah. Like as if he's going to federal jail. Like he's on his way out of... Like something huge has befallen him. And I've been reading an, an article by Jorge Valdano in The Guardian, who is an Argentinian legend. He talks about the pressure that's on Messi and how the Argentinian media and the fan base has bought into this idea that the 33 titles he's won, the representation he's given Argentinian soccer on the world stage with Barcelona means nothing if he doesn't win a World Cup and match El Diego. Which is in... It, you think about it and you think, oh, that's one guy's opinion. And then you look at what's happening at our, on Argentinian TV. They did a segment the other day. I don't know what channel it was. It appeared on my Twitter. And it was basically Messi's warm-up side-by-side with Maradona's warm-up from Napoli in the the late 1980s. So Maradona has this famous clip on YouTube where he's warming up for a game. He's got his uh, training tracksuit on, and he's bouncing the ball on his head, and he just looks so free and at ease with himself. And it goes to Messi, where Messi's got the hunched shoulders, and he looks, I don't know, detached, away, locked in his own mind. And I'm thinking, how unfair is that? Over 30 years ago, two different people. And by the way, Messi, in terms of winning things, leaves Diego Maradona in the shade. But Maradona has the World Cup. And it's all culminated into this massive pressure that's on Messi. It's kind of like if Sidney Crosby won four Stanley Cups, but he never won an Olympic gold for Canada. And everybody in Canada said, I don't care how great you are. I don't care if you're one of the greatest captains of all time. I don't care how many cups you got. If you don't have a gold medal in the Olympics, you mean nothing. Imagine Sidney Crosby spent the bulk of his teenage years, his formative years, away from the country to which he would represent. And that's what's happened with Messi, too. There's been this kind of skeptical view of him because he spent so much time as a development of Spanish football, as a development of the Barcelona Academy. So is there a detachment in terms, is he one of our own? Whereas Diego is in the stands, he's smoking cigars, we can watch the highlights of that great goal against England, the way he took apart Belgium, the whole thing. And and Messi doesn't have that yet, which is, it's, it's an unfair standard to judge him on. And Valdano says it's a standard that journalists should stop trying to push him toward. 
J.J. Devaney joins us to break down the World Cup in studio. You can watch at watchda.com. Let's talk about the match of the entire tournament, which was Germany and Sweden. Number one, Sweden has the draw. They've got the 1-1, and they're up a man with, what, eight minutes to play? That included stoppage time. Did you think that Sweden became way too conservative considering it seemed like Germany was on the attack down a man trying to get that game-winning goal? There's a lot of people who will have watched Sweden, DA, and they would have said, look, get them out of the tournament. Get them out. Get them out. They're done. They have... <laughs> They have a creative talent in, in Emil Forsberg who's not used because they play so direct. I thought the goal they scored, let me go back to the goal they scored to go 1-0 up. Toivonen's goal was just wonderful. I know it was from a turnover, but the, the angles, the geometry to lift it over Manuel Neuer, chest control, bang, flick it up over into the net. Fantastic. And I thought, hey, maybe this Swedish team isn't as boring as a wet Saturday assembling an Ikea desk. Because that's what they are. You know, like, they're terrible. Yeah, totally. But they get, this, they get this moment where Botang sent off, and you think, go on, go for the jugular. But it's not in them. They made a substitution. John Gidetti comes on, who um, Glasgow Celtic fans in the city here or across America will know, a guy who they liked and they wished they got more out of. And... Gidetti comes on, and I thought, he's going to do something. It's going to be good. It's going to be bad. This has been erased from history. At 1-1, Gidetti has a chance. He hits it straight at Neuer instead of squaring to Forsberg. That's 2-1 Sweden with a Germany team who's on the rack. Germany are going out of the group stage for the first time in their history. Defending champs on the This was like the Patriots coming off a Super Bowl and in the wild card round being on the ropes at home down 14 in the fourth. To me, that Gidetti act of selfishness instead of squaring to his teammate was the sliding doors moment for this Swedish team. Possibly in the tournament, remains to be seen. And Kroos then goes and does that. Which, in terms of being clutch in soccer... Oh. The roar of the crowd. Oh. We did a little piece last night on our podcast on ESPN, uh, which you can download quite easily from a number of different areas. And <laughs> DA, it was wonderful what we did. Andrew basically played Sauna by Rammstein, the, the beginning of it, and the chorus with the commentary of Jonathan Pierce from England about the drama of that moment. And he builds Cross up to be this big player, and the big player delivers. Oh, it was incredible. That goal at that moment, at that time, the way that he scored was basically a walk-off. You almost never see walk-off winners in soccer yeah. in the World Cup. That was essentially a walk-off home run. Trot around the bases. We're going home with the win. By the way, there's only one place he can put that to score. Yep. And ordinarily in soccer, you know, you would look to put that in to the box. The guy with no confidence, he's clipping that in into the mixer, as we say. Let, 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 let the chips fall where they may. But he took it on his shoulders, obviously clearly burdened by what had happened before uh, because he gave away the ball in the lead-up to the Swedish goal. And he says, I'm taking this on me. I'm going to make this happen. And he puts it in the one place the keeper can't get to. That's why we love the game. That's why. And so that brings us to Mexico, where because of pulling that out of the fire, Mexico, despite two wins in their first two matches, any other country, every other team that has had two wins the first two matches of the group stage have advanced through. Mexico could get screwed here because of that goal. It's not guaranteed that they would move into the elimination round, the knockout stage, out of the group round. They've got one more match to go. Do you find that to be soccer gods being unfair because Mexico has done everything they possibly could well in the first two matches, right? Deeply unkind. Very unfair. Think about it. Their perennial last 16 Guys, they're always there. We call them the Dallas Cowboys, right? They're always 9-7, and seven, but they're never good enough to win a Super Bowl. No, but when they beat Germany in their opening game, the world champions, they're looking at what? They're thinking, oh, my God, we've got South Korea next. We can beat them. This is opening up. We've got Sweden in the final game. Maybe we get to the round of 16. Now, I know they're potentially a tough draw in the round of 16, but forget that for a second. Maybe we can get there and we can believe. Or if not... If not, we'll have done something amazing in the group. Right. And that could be snatched away from them. It's terribly unfair, but isn't that the way it's meant to be? That, that, you know, there's, there's, there's no justice in life, and if, if soccer is a reflection of life, then there we go. <laughs> um, I really want them to go through, and I'll tell you why. They play Sweden tomorrow, and like I said, I want rid of Sweden. I think Mexico have more <laughs> to offer the tournament. Agreed. That sounds so clinical. I want rid of Sweden. <laughs> I want rid of yeah, Sweden. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not, you know, but, but Sweden are... 
that they can't make a run. Mexico, with the way that they're playing, as organized, I feel like disciplined, that. they feel like they could win a couple games. Yeah. Now, my worry is that the massed ranks of the Swedish defense is going to be something. They're not going to play a particularly high line, which Mexico like to get in with runners behind, with Leon, um, with um, uh, Chucky Lozano, with, with Vea. That's, that's probably not going to happen. Sweden are going to be crafty, Sweden. Okay, they're going to be like the screw that's missing from the IKEA desk, and you got to go back to IKEA, causing <laughs> causing mass frustration. Because only IKEA has that damn screw. Yeah, right. And they're supposed to give it to you, but they didn't. <laughs> so I'm talking about uh, IKEA levels of frustration being created by Sweden, <laughs> and then they catch them on the break. That's the way they're going to play. Um, I would love to say that there's going to be an expansive Sweden come out and we have a great game, but I don't see it. JJ Devaney joins us from the Cut Offside podcast here on the show, breaking down the World Cup. Boy, this English team is way different than any other English oh, team. DA. Because every other English team has been star studded, star laden, lots of tabloid fodder. This one is kind of under the radar, team guys, chemistry guys. And then to lay a six drop, mm. I mean, to drop six goals over the weekend and that win, is it okay to believe? Is it okay to believe? Because you compared England to the New York Jets. One championship of the 60s, and we'll never stop hearing about it. Is it okay for Jets fans, English fans, to believe? Well, if you go down the road and you hammer the Titans and you come back up to New York, do you say, hey, look, we beat the Titans, we're on a roll? No, you don't. You okay. say, they're the Titans. You're not buying yet. No, I'm not buying. And what's interesting is that you are. <laughs> you, the chiseled, grizzled New York sports guy, is buying into this already. I'm, I'm surprised. Now, there's been a veneer. A, um, a thick coating of PR has been put on this team. And do you know what? They are likable. Maybe they, we don't need the PR. They're, 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 you saw Jesse Lingard, his goal, his performance, the way he acted on the sideline, kicking his socks with Trent Alexander-Arnold. There, there is a likability to them. I don't, my natural Irishness and my, my predilection to, to want them to lose in everything <laughs> is not as maybe triggered as it usually is. But they've... They've scraped by Tunisia, and at times Tunisia played exceptionally well against them. I think that's been glossed over a little bit. Panama are terrible. Record levels terrible. They're bad. Um, how do I feel about England, really? Look, their set pieces are working. That's important in this tournament. They've got a striker in form, five goals. Harry Kane, that's important too. The problem for me, DA, is they're already through. Belgium are already through. They're both going to look at that final game and think, uh, you know what, let's rest some players. Belgium have to because they've got injuries. So we may come through this group not knowing anything about either England or Belgium, but England in particular. That's a problem for me. And then they go in against the uh, possibly Senegal, maybe Colombia. And let me give you a quote from the BBC. Rio Ferdinand on the BBC after beating Panama 6-1 said the following, we have nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about from Senegal or Colombia. Uh-oh. Yeah, that uh -oh. is the hype machine. It's gone into overdrive. <laughs> You're on board. Even you, you are backing up the feral English media. It's crazy. Look, I want them to go as deep as possible so that the fall is as calamitous as possible as an Irishman. I know, I know, no, 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 no. I don't mean that. I love England. I love them in the same way. We've all got that... Be that best friend, DA. You know, he's your guy, he's your buddy, but you absolutely hate him most of the time. That's England to me.